I want to say thank you to all those that have been so active for so long in uh, standing up for a world of peace rather than the idea that you solve every problem around the world by sending troops and bombers in to bring about a peace. Afghanistan and Iraq, and I'm still meeting asylum seekers coming to this country from Afghanistan who do not have a place of safety in Afghanistan any more than many people do in many parts of Iraq. And so those people tell a very human story that after all these years and all this money that's been spent on all these wars, there are still people who are unable to remain living in their own homes and home, home communities and end up having to flee somewhere else. So there has to be an understanding of the issues, an understanding of the way in which those decisions were taken in order to go to war. And like Diane, we were both in Parliament at the time, having those discussions and having those debates and feeling a sense of very deep frustration. We had inquiries after the Iraq war, but preceding that, Surely every politician should have noticed what popular opinion was actually like. The huge march that we had in London was uh, paralleled by events in 600 cities around the world. I went to events in the United States during that period in Washington and in San Francisco and later on in Chicago and other cities. It wasn't as if there wasn't also a huge movement to try and stop war and move for peace all across the USA. Somewhere along the line, the political establishments all across the Western world, or most of the Western world, got it wrong and sent the troops in. And we are paying the price for that, and a lot of people, more importantly, have paid the price for that with a loss of life, be they civilians or soldiers on any side of the conflict. What about and so, so, I'm to that. And so when the Chilcot report was finally authorised by Gordon Brown, I was pleased he'd done that because the previous reports in Egypt had been clearly inadequate. There had to be a full inquiry. Many of us were very sceptical that um, the Chilcot went on for so long, cost so much money, and produced such a very long report. I received a copy of it um, a couple of three hours before it was. Um, finally um, released to the public and uh, I sat in a sealed room to read it with a few colleagues and we went through. Um, I managed about five or six hundred of the eight hundred introductory paragraphs and I had a whole bookshelf in my office with the rest of the report on it. I can't pretend I've read every bit of it, I absolutely haven't, um, but there are some incredibly important lessons that have to be learned from Chilcot. And that is why I felt that it was good to have it. And I also felt the Select Committee report on Libya, which I'll come back to in a moment, is equally important. I also felt that it was important politically to move on in this matter. And so, during the leadership election last year, 2015, um, I gave an undertaking that I would, if elected to this position, give an apology for what had happened in Iraq, and I arranged to do that to an audience mainly of the families of um, servicemen and women who have lost, lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you think about them, and think about what they're going through, because their sons and daughters are never going to come back. They have to live with that for the rest of their lives. And I thought the very least we could do is give a respectful apology in their presence and pledge that we would always try and do things differently and not send the troops into harm's way, but to do everything possible to bring about political solutions to the crisis that the face people in the next time. So I, gave, I gave that apology to the and uh, I'm pleased that I did so. The Select Committee report on Libya indicates many of much the same mistakes were made. It's as if the lessons of Iraq had not been learned before the troops were sent into Libya. And as Diane very well pointed out, there is an issue here of the refugee crisis that comes as a result of these wars. The refugee crisis that is 
of global crisis. There are more displaced people on this planet now than have ever been at any time in recorded history. The majority, the vast majority of refugees in any part of the world end up being looked after in a barely sustainable way in often the very poorest countries in the world. The numbers that actually make it to Western Europe or the United States, North Africa, North America, or other parts of North America or Australia is actually very, very small. I don't like to use the word burden, but the support that's given to refugees often comes from the poorest countries and the poorest people doing what they can to support them. And I think we should just reflect on that for a moment. It's often very poor people in Greece that are helping to feed refugees that arrive on boats landing on an island that is already very crowded and virtually bereft of its public services. And so there is a hand of humanity that's reached out at a local level. Sadly, that hand of humanity is not reached out in the way it should be across the whole of Europe or indeed across the whole of North America. I simply say this, you won't solve the refugee crisis with um, gunboats, barbed wire, tear gas and uh, uh, opposition to them. You will only solve it by a hand of humanity and friendship and dealing with the causes of the refugee crisis. Opposed the wars in Afghanistan, opposed the war in Iraq, opposed the military involvement in Libya, or indeed the proposals for Britain to undertake bombing campaigns in Syria, never did so from the point of view of approval of the status quo or the regime that was there. We did so because we didn't believe that a bombing campaign and military solutions were on offer. There had to be a political solution. Many of us actually marched against arms sales to Iraq long before the original 1991. <laughs> and the crisis in Syria is of course the main source of the refugee crisis at the present time. I, I say this, the pain and suffering and deaths and loss and destruction in Syria has to stop there has to be a ceasefire, there has to be an end by bombing by anybody on any target, anywhere in Syria. No. targets were, and in particular, if international law has been broken by any of those people doing it. But there has to be a political solution in Syria. It is not going to be achieved by more bombing and more arms flowing in. Therefore, Geneva 2 Geneva has to be reconvened. There has to be... I understand what you're saying, but I, I try to put, put it this way. Geneva has to be reconvened. There has to be a peace process to bring about a political solution in Syria as quickly as possible. So those people that are trying to get by in refugee camps in Jordan or in Lebanon, or those that are on the beaches in Turkey or Greece or various other parts of Europe. There also has to be a change in the attitude and mentality across much of Western Europe. Some countries, Germany in particular, have been um, good in their try to reach out to accept large numbers of refugees. This country has put a limit on it and is gracefully still not even fulfilled a very minimal um, offer of 3,000 unaccompanied child refugees. There is a refugee crisis across Europe. It's not going to be solved by hatred of refugees, by claiming they are the problem. They are the victims of the problem, not the cause of the problem.
visited the refugee camps in Calais and Dunkirk, what I saw there was people that were utterly desperate and had made incredible journeys in order to get, order to, get to a place of safety. At a different time, a different generation, books would be written about the heroism of those families that had managed to get through impossible odds in order to get to a place of limited safety, namely a pretty fetid refugee camp in Calais. Can't we understand? History is unfolding before us. Are we going to go in the direction of saying there is a military solution to every crisis around the world, or are we going to say, instead, cannot we base our attitude, our foreign policy, on international law, on human rights, on justice, democracy, and supporting the victims of war? Well, that's right. <laughs> Syria. I want a political solution as oh, quickly as possible. Well, and that is what we're trying to say here today. What I would also say, what I would also say, is that one of the, one of the lessons, one of the lessons of the crisis is also to look at the war that is going on currently in Yemen and the bombing that's taking place in Yemen. Then ask yourself some rather difficult questions. Where did those weapons come from that are being used in order to bomb Yemen at the present time? And when it comes to it that an all-party House of Commons Select Committee, including Conservatives and people who have historically supported some, if not all, of the military interventions, say that it's time for this country to suspend its arms sales that have been used to bomb Yemen, surely there is a bit of a turning point in a political thought process. I think we should suspend those arms sales in order to end the lives that are ruined. They last for a very long time. There are still problems of depleted uranium that was used during the Gulf War in 1991 in southern Iraq. The consequences of war goes on for very many generations, and the bitterness and hatred goes on for a very long time. And so the whole point of world peace movements, the whole point of looking at things in a different way, is very important. I want to thank Stop the War Coalition for its enormous contribution to showing there was opposition to Afghanistan and Iraq wars, showing that there is a huge body of public opinion in Britain, maybe not adequately represented in the media, and saying, well, actually, there is a different way of doing things. We can make a different contribution to this world. And what I want to see is a foreign policy dedicated to universal human rights, dedicated to supporting and promoting democracy, dedicated to bringing about a decent opportunity and standard of life and living for people in often the poorest countries in the world. The juxtaposition of a massive expenditure globally on arms and a relatively minimal expenditure on clean water, sanitation, housing, farming, and all the other things that matters, and not doing enough about climate change and global weather change, weather pattern change, which would have such a massive impact. Those are the issues we should be concentrating on. A political solution, a human rights solution, a democratic solution, a development solution. Otherwise, we're going to descend into what war next, in what country next. Our purpose surely is that we're actually united on all of those issues. United about the kind of world we want to live in, and united in understanding there are people all over the world that actually have very similar ideas and wishes. But two weeks ago, or less than that, the Conservative Party conference decided the big problem facing Britain was actually registering everybody of foreign birth and where they were. We cannot descend into a society based on suspicion and xenophobia and all the racism that comes from it. Societies that come together, multicultural societies that come together, wanting peace, wanting justice, wanting social justice and opportunities for all, are societies that do well. Societies that go in the other direction of dividing people by xenophobia, by racism, 
don't achieve very much because when you've ended up with all the blame culture and all the blaming of every foreigner that happens to be here, you haven't actually solved any of those problems either here or anywhere else in the world. The only solution is people coming together. The only solution is a path to peace. The only solution to a path to peace is dedicating yourself to the path to peace from the very beginning and condemning those that try and take things in a different direction. I was elected leader of the Labour Party because there was a massive upsurge of opinion within the Labour Party and the Labour movement that politics could and should be done differently. That people's voices should be heard. We should have real democracy both within our movement but also within our parliament so there is a War Powers Act, there is a proper uh, consideration of every deployment before it actually takes place. It is fundamentally a democratic argument. Stop the War Movement, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, all the many different peace organisations that have come together, most of whom are represented in this room here today, certainly understand that. Theirs surely is the voice of hope. Theirs surely is the voice of peace. Theirs surely is the voice that can bring about the solution to the terrible problems that this world faces and the victims who face it, either by death through bombing by somebody or by destitution and poverty and sometimes death from starvation in refugee camps around the world. It's our responsibility in a world of plenty to make sure there is peace and make sure that plenty is shared, not taken for a minority who benefits so much from it at the expense of the rest of us. Thank you for all you do for peace. Thank you.